Yes, so I talk to you. Brilliant. Am I looking over here or am I looking at you? <laughs> One, take one. Speed of one. Good luck, everyone. My name is Julian Unthank. I'm the writer and creator of Queens of Mystery. Classically, there's four different types of detective. And with our four queens, um, I decided we created the show to make each one a different type of detective. And so we have, uh, we start off with Beth who's the older sister. I am Sarah Woodward and I play Beth Stone, who is the eldest of the three aunts. I don't like the idea that she's the eldest, really. I don't feel like I'm the eldest, but apparently she is. But probably only by a few months. What are you staring at, Grandma? Charming. And she's what's called the intuitive. She's like a Miss Marple type detective. And her books reflect that. She's got this, she writes these books about this vicar, inner city vicar who solves crimes. Beth is the, the mother earth of the family. She's the maternal one. Definitely, she's the most maternal one, even though she doesn't have children. So she's the one that I would say is the sensible one of the three. Although she's not sensible, she's sensible. Does that make sense? Uh, and she's the, I'd say that she's, she's the nice one. She's the human one. She will actually give someone a hug if they really want it. Um, I think deep down she quite wants to be a little bit more cat. Um, and this cat, uh, she's what they call a lone wolf. My name is Julie Graham and I play Cat Stone. Which is kind of like your PI. So the, what the, the detective used to flourish in the sort of 1940s, a sort of hardball detective. And Cat writes these graphic novels about a uh, music industry fixer in the 80s, because Cat was an ex-member of a rock band and grew up in that sort of era. Cat, I suppose, is the rebel of the family, so she's rebellious, outspoken, um, Bye. smart, uh, Bye. cagey. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say she's outrageous, but she's kind of just, she thinks outside the box, so she's kind of not um, conventional in any way. Um, yeah, I'd say I, I'd say in one word, she's a kind of yeah, she's got a kind of rebellious soul, I think. And Jane is the um, she's what they call um, sort of uber logical. I am Siobhan Redmond, and I play Jane Stone. You know, she's um, uber uh, rational, um, like the Sherlock Holmes type detective, um, and her books follow this futuristic robot detective who thinks like a robot, like, like Mr. Like Mr. Spock. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? that everything's a little bit too convenient. Well, you heard Inspector Thorne. The facts are obvious. That he's forgetting Sherlock Holmes. Yes, there's nothing more deceptive than an obvious, obvious fact. fact. Jane is uh, a very clever woman for whom the, the physical and the practical world are something of a mystery, but she's not overly exercised with that. She manages to uh, fight her way through on brain power. She sort of uses her body as a place to put her brain. And then the final type of detective is what's called a normal, which is like sort of May Gray, you know, DCI Barnaby from Midsummer, and that's Matilda. Hi, my name's Florence Hall. I play Matilda Stone in Queens of Mystery. Matilda, because Matilda was brought up by her three aunts and this huge influence, she's a kind of amalgamation of all the different types of detective rolled into one. Matilda is a detective. She works for Wild Marsh, and, uh, which is the village that she grew up in with her three aunts. You might want to think about installing a security camera. Oh dear. She solves the alarming number of murders that take place in such a sleepy town. Um, she's quite an independent character, a little solitary, quite um, bookish and keeps herself to herself. But she's, uh, I think, very well-intentioned, very kind of likes people and loves the town that she lives in. The idea for the show is that all our aunts will investigate a murder and a crime in different ways, but at the end of it, they all come to the same conclusion because they're all great detectives. My name's Martin Treneman. I play Detective Inspector Derek Thorne. Well, he's a good, solid copper. Um, he doesn't suffer fools that gladly. Uh, he's sort of quite impatient about, about bit, particularly with the aunts. Um, but he's got a good soul, so he's, he tries to look after Matilda, uh, even though he's quite abrupt with her, quite brusque with her. He's got a 
little bit of a yearning, like a massive yearning for uh, Jane. And um, he just hasn't quite got the courage, should we say, uh, to do anything about that. I mean, he, he tries to do something about it, but tragically, he hasn't got the confidence. I'm Michael Elcock and I play PC Terry Foster in Queens of Mystery. PC Terry Foster's a man in love. <laughs> he's a young man in love, but he's a, he's a local police officer of Wild Marsh. Uh, and his boss is Inspector Derek Thorne and Matilda Stone uh, comes into the mix and just, you know, sets his world spiralling crazy. Um, and he kind of develops a little bit of a fancy for her. Uh, but yeah, not at heart, he's just a kind of a young man who wants to do his job well and he wants to make his mum proud. <laughs> I've got tea now, I'm happy. <laughs> and Pedro. Yeah, and some Pedro. And then, yeah. and then I think. So stand by on sausage. And we're running. Oh, I'm I'm Linda James, I'm one of the producers. And I'm Savannah James Bailey and I'm the other producer. We met with Julian Onthank, who pitched us this idea of about three friends um, who were crime writers and enjoyed solving mysteries. And that sort of evolved into Queens of Mystery with three crime writing sisters and their uh, detective niece. We start off learning about Matilda, our lead actress, our lead star, and Matilda Stone. Uh, three years old, mother goes missing uh, under mysterious circumstances, and she's raised by her three aunts, and grows up in a place called Murder Inc., which is a bookshop, crime bookshop. And Matilda's childhood is spent reading crime fiction of all sorts. She's crime mad. And then when she becomes 18, she, becomes, she leaves home, becomes a police officer. And when we first meet the adult Matilda, uh, she comes back to Wild Marsh, her hometown, to take up the role of Detective Sergeant. Um, we're very, we're very excited to have her back in the fold. So we are far more of a family now than we were previously. And she moves back into Murder Inc. with her Aunt Jane, who owns the shop. Have a good day at work. And subsequently gets stuck into solving crimes, murders. It's a lot of murders in Wild Marsh. So the aunts are all very proud of her, and they just basically, every time she tries to Invest, <clears throat> investigate a crime, they, um, what's the best word? Well, I suppose meddle. They're always being accused of meddling. We prefer to think of it as supporting a loved one. Um, which I think Matilda equally enjoys, but she, she equally gets frustrated with them all the time as well, so. But the main reason she's come home is to find out what's happened to her mother. So she, during the course of the series, she starts to investigate the crimes. Uh, the, what, what, what exactly happened to her mother, whether it was a crime or whether she took herself off. Uh, what Matilda doesn't know, but the audience learns, is that her aunts know a lot more about her mother's disappearance than she does. They're trying to protect her from this family secret um, that's the connected with her mother, the disappearance of her mother when she was a child. If Matilda ever finds out, we have to pray she doesn't. And we realise that we're not the only ones who are keeping this a secret. You know, Inspector Thorne knows a lot more. There are lots of characters that come up that, that know a lot more. And also there's a man that lives in the, uh, the windmill, which is an iconic sort of building in the town, that has a sort of unusual interest in Matilda. And we have to be very, very careful about that, for Matilda's sake. And that's where we leave them at the end of uh, season one. I'm Ian Eames and I'm the director of Queens of Mystery. Queens of Mystery season two, I would say, is ambitious on all fronts, beginning with the story, in that uh, the writer Julian Unthank has pushed the genre. I mean, he always is a, I think he's a genius, he knows that. Um, and he's also incredibly versant with 
uh, the thriller genre, the mystery genre, crime writing. So he kind of explores all kinds of strands and interweaves them and brings them together in just the most wonderful way. Uh, season two is going to be great. I really think, um, I think the scripts are stronger. We all know what we're doing a bit more. The actors are in a really comfortable place. In this series, we see a little bit more about the, the, the family dynamic and their place in the, in the village where they live. More things are kind of unearthed as the, we go through the series to do with this, this kind of family secret. There's three great um, scenarios for Matilda, some fantastic guest characters for her to sort of pit her wits against. In the first uh, couple of episodes, uh, Beth has been asked by the local newspaper, the Wild Rush Watchman, to write a travel piece or a review of a local health spa, a very upmarket health spa. <laughs> Rowena Walker, general manager and head of public relations. And you must be, don't tell me, a cat, former volcanic youth guitarist and award-winning graphic novelist, meaning you must be Beth, best-selling author and intrepid guest columnist of the Wild Marsh Watchman. You've done your homework. <laughs> so her and Cat decide to sort of go to the house bar and pamper themselves for a couple of days while Jane looks after the shop. Uh, episode two, which would be episodes three and four, the middle story, Cat's uh, artwork is selected for the opening of his fantastically upmarket, posh, modern gallery that's opening up in Wildmarsh. Careful. Just, oh. Cat Stone, am I right? Yeah, Una Low. I run a commercial space in London. The Lowdown Gallery? Oh, hi. My pal Vanessa's been banging on about a fab local artist she'd found for the opening of Egdo. Oh, that's how you say it. We'll take this in for you. And the last two, the last story in the season is set in the Wild Marsh Heritage Centre, I think you'd call it, um, where Jane's recording an audio book. So her and Beth are recording an audio book while Cat looks after Murder Inc. The Attenborough Equivalency by Jane Stone. Chapter One. The call came in at 2 a.m. Gunfire heard coming from the Ferguson residence. Um, and the Heritage Centre is famous for being the home of a lot of uh, Edgar Allan Poe memorabilia including the sort of very famous original manuscript for the Telltale Heart. The original manuscript for which you can see on display behind me. Don't touch that. It's very sharp. The Queens of Mystery obviously has a lot of literary inspiration and I know that our audience do enjoy finding the Easter eggs that we've sort of peppered throughout the scripts and the stories. The Pit and the Pendulum refers to one of Edgar Allan Poe's works. So within the Poe room, we have the original manuscript of the Telltale Heart, but we also have some costumes inspired by his literary works. And we have this very large swinging pendulum um, with this sort of ax on the end, which provides this ominous backdrop through a lot of the scenes in that story. There's lots of sort of literary pun names in the sort of places and streets. We've got lots of things like that going on, but uh, they're, they're quite fun to, to, uh, to write in the script. You wait here. I'll bring you the files. The series has created, in a way, a kind of iconic figure in Matilda, uh, in the way she looks and the way she appears to be, but also in her role within the series it's possible to, to get another actor to play that role. That said, um, Florence, who's now taken on the role, is visually, you know, almost, you, you really can't tell her apart from Olivia previously. With her great blessing, um, we embarked on recasting, and there is absolutely no question that when we saw Florence, it, it was quite clear that she, she could in, incarnate um, Olivia. I mean, Olivia did a fantastic job in season one in establishing uh, Matilda. Um, and Florence has just sort of taken that baton and run with it. I mean, we knew from the minute, you know, the first couple of seconds of her audition, you just knew she's an absolutely worthy successor, you know. It works as well for the story because this is a slightly more confident Matilda now that we're meeting. And, um, she brings a slightly different essence to the role that is a continuation of what Olivia started. So, What Florence brings is, is a kind of a very modern sharpness, you know, and very um, 
she's a very smart Matilda. She has all the same qualities as before, but somehow there's a kind of edge, a new edge to her, which I think is more contemporary. She's done an amazing job, and I think she's the chemistry as well with the other cast members, the aunts and the love interest, Daniel, it's been fantastic, and I've really enjoyed watching the rushes and stuff. It's been brilliant. I can't wait for the audience to see it. Uh, these days, I'm a bit more life of the party. Um, I think I just am better at letting my hair down these days. Novels at the moment as more of escapism. Sweet, which is annoying. I wish I was savoury, but... City. I grew up in the country and I love it, but... Um, City's much more fun. Funniest moments on set are always when I really shouldn't be laughing. Favourite scene to shoot so far has been fight sequence in episode six, The Raven. Um, I really enjoyed the kind of challenge of that active scene and uh, a little bit of stunt. I'm not saying I do, you know, I do have a stunt double, but a little bit of stunts. And that was good fun. Murder mystery, because I'm always on brand. It has been wonderful. Yeah, it's been, it was all quite whirlwind. I think kind of got the role with two weeks notice, but everyone's been wonderful. Everyone's really welcomed me in. Um, I you know, had the advantage of being able to watch season one and I watched it a few times and watched all the beautiful work that Olivia did with uh, the role of Matilda in season one and, you know, I've tried to absorb of as much of that as possible and trying to honour all the work that she did as well as kind of bringing my own stuff to the role. Um, and the cast have been wonderful, the crew have all been wonderful. Um, it's felt really, uh, yeah, I was a bit nervous sort of first day at school, you know, well, I have to eat lunch by myself in the corner of the canteen and everyone will be mean to me, but everyone's been lovely. So yeah, I'm having a wonderful time. The Americans are so good at this. It's in a way you're creating a um, character that can be remem easily remembered and recognizable anywhere at any time. So, you know, we went with the blue coat, the, the shirts, which are very graphic and sometimes slightly psychedelic, the blonde hair, it's definitely you know, she's a character, she's a kind of superhero character. I'm Charlie Knight and I'm the costume designer. So Jane is the Tin Man, Kat is Scarecrow, and Beth is the Lion. So that hence where their colours come from and their sort of silhouettes of... So we've stuck with that right the way through this and this time we've just kind of lifted them a little bit slightly, we got, we got a bit braver. For the colour coding of the aunts came from the Wizard of Oz. Dorothy is Matilda, which is, you know, the use of white and blue and sometimes a dash of red. And you'll see that's, it's not a, an absolute fixed rule, but when you see them together, you'll recognize those color schemes as coming from the Wizard of Oz. Certainly for my costumes, it's all very kind of reflecting her past life as a, as in a rock and roll band and then kind of being a, you know, a graphic artist and all that sort of stuff. So each character has a very individual look and um, with makeup and costume. So we've got a very talented makeup and costume team who kind of um, bring bring all those kind of elements out of the characters. And it, and it really helps with the playing of it as well. For Beth, her costumes are quite a lot of yellow. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of the, 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 the brighter one of the three, I'd say. Um, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of colour for Beth and uh, they're very comfortable, they're very easy. Everybody always comments on, you know, you come in, you, beginning of the day, you put your cosies on and everyone goes, oh, I like that one, oh, oh, that's nice. So you know you're onto a winner when everybody on the set likes what you're wearing <laughs> and, would, and would take bits of it. So it's, it's very easy. I don't have to think about what my character is because the costumes do it all for you. They really do. Charlie's brilliant at that sort of thing. Um, my costumes, are, I'm absolutely delighted by. I love working with Charlie, who designs the costumes for this. Um, 
it's a, it's a very collaborative process and she's very accommodating about ideas that we might have. Mm -hmm. Yes, whatever you say. As you see from Jane's look, it's a very clear style, which I really enjoy. And um, because it's quite held in, you see that the sort of Jane's head floats above everything else, which is very Jane. I myself find it a little claustrophobic sometimes, but um, that's actually quite useful. It's quite helpful, really. So Jane's head goes and then the rest of it follows. When I put the, the, the suit on, the shoes, it, it, it sort of becomes him, really. Um, and makeup, I mean, makeup is part of it as well, you know, the, the hair particularly. But um, yeah, it's the, it's the suit and the shoes. As soon as the boots are on, and as soon as the, I put the hat on, it's like that's the, that's the final step in terms of making me feel like, you know, a proper couple is cool. Well, this time around, the aunts have got, I'm, I'm not repeating any costumes. So, so once they've seen it, we've seen it in a story day, we'll never see it again. It's never going to come back. I mean, there might be, a, you know, a belt or a pair of trousers that will come back round, but the entire look itself will never come back round again. So that's quite a nice thing to know that each day, each story day they have, they'll, they'll have a completely different change, as will Matilda. A lot of shows that you watch, you watch the, the, the ages change where you've got these kind of young, the very young women in a particular shade or, you know, they, they've, they've got all these really exciting costumes and then you watch the women get older throughout the show and then they suddenly become very frumpy and the, the, they, they lose all the, the colour palette and we don't do that, that we push, you know, our, our three core women are, you know, of, of, a, of an age, they're over 45 and they rock everything they wear and it, I, I love that that they, they come in when we first start you know doing the fittings they're like what what's the what we're going to work what we're going to do how are we going to push it what we're going to and they put their clothes on they're like I would never wear this normally and I love it and, I, and that feels really nice that feels sort of like it's a real positive push for just normal women to go hmm, I wouldn't wouldn't normally buy this or wear this or do this but they'll try it because they can see that you don't have to disappear as soon as you hit 45. <laughs> so I like that feeling. I'd, I'd say that um, in terms of hair and makeup, it's quite, it's, it takes a long time to make us look this middle-aged. So we are in the chair for, you know, a good couple of, no, we're in the chair for about an hour because they need, they need to try and get rid of the bags. And when, you, when you're up at sort of five or six in the morning, it's okay if you're 28, it's not so good if you're, a little bit older than that, so it takes a bit of work. But Jane and the colour of Jane's hair are really important to this, so I'm afraid I'm a thorn in the side of the hair and makeup department. They have to spend absolutely hours with me to get me to look like a human, but hey, it's all part of the fun of the day at work, isn't it? My hair usually is is very sharp, it's slick, it's whatever, it's kind of a London hairstyle. Because Wildmarsh is a, is a village town and it's set outside of London, they wanted the character of uh, Terry to, to, to not be as stylish. So we had to kind of like even out the edges and kind of make him a bit rough. So, you know, we, we do my hair, we do the beard, we do that kind of thing. And then it's onto the makeup. And yeah, that's, that's it. It usually takes about, I'm gonna say half an hour. But the, the, the makeup um, team are lovely. They're cool people and we get on and we just have a laugh. So time flies by, you know. I think the aunt's look sort of really glowy and Matilda looks, you know, really sort of, she, she looks more sort of moddy this time. Um, and the costumes obviously complement that. We work really closely together all the time. It was, it's, a, it's a real sort of progressive relationship with all of us, including the art department as well. They, they come in, they've, they've got a you know, big chunk of, especially on the, this series, because we've kind of lifted it sort of, sort of Wes Anderson vibes you know, more to that direction. So we've had to all work together really closely. So it's always been the case, I suppose, in the great tradition of Agatha Christie, that the the the, the house, the the precinct, is a character of itself. And you know, 
um, whether it's boats on the Nile and who, who's, who's on them. Um, and, and I suppose to that extent, you know, we are creating murder mystery in that tradition. And so for us, the location is always absolutely crucial. Each episode has a guest location, which is a character in the story. What that does is it brings, again, it's a world within a world. So you have Wild Marsh, the world of Wild Marsh, but each episode, the, the Queens of Mystery and, and Matilda enter this kind of alternate universe, which has its own visual language. So I'm David Brittenham and I am the location manager. We are engaging mainly with the producers, uh, the director, uh, the art department. So you're trying to get a, an overall feel for, for what they are trying to achieve. Um, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a combination team effort. So what we do is just try and make sure that they have enough options that from our side, quietly, we can facilitate them to get into beautiful locations like here. Hi, I'm Maria Dagger. I'm the production designer on Queens of Mystery season two. Locations was a key element on this one um, because they do have such a strong visual element um, and they are so key to the story. So each script has a main location that is almost a character on itself. Um, so we work very, really closely with uh, location manager and Ian, of course, director and the OP Sarah uh, to choose them, um, you know, accordingly and to have a strong visual impact with them. Uh, and had a bit of fun dressing them. When you find a location like this, I think it really shows the interconnectivity of all of the departments because the art design is led by the location sometimes, or sometimes it could be the other way around. Um, and then we're building characters that sometimes will shift the script so that the characters fit better into the place that we're going to put them in. The location and the art department have just excelled themselves. There's some incredible locations. Um, it's really unusual for a writer because you sit in your little office and you you think about these sets and what's going to happen and, and you go to the set on the day and you think you know, it's 10 times better than I could ever imagine. This show in particular has a really strong look. Right now where we're talking, uh, Cowdray Hall has become the Wild Marsh Wellness Retreat. With uh, Sparring with Death, which is where we are at the moment, you know, we're in this absolutely spectacular um, Cowdray House. Um, in West Sussex. It's an absolutely glorious estate uh, that's our luxury spa. And the art department, obviously, you, you take a location like this and they, they give it their, their mark, you know, whether it's with graphics and branding or props or... So, but we've got a very, very beautiful basis on which to work both the house itself and the grounds. I do worry a little bit sometimes with houses like this because they're so high-end and, and so grand that you think, okay, trying to put your, um, your look into something that is so defined, it is quite a tricky one, I'm not going to lie. So, so yeah, I think these are the, the locations that maybe I struggle a little bit with. Um, it looks amazing, it's beautiful, so you try to bring elements that kind of live in this world without standing out too much. Everything is kind of light and, and perfect and like a health spa, you know, but meantime, there are these murders going on behind the scenes. And then we, we filmed at the most wonderful place in London called Strawberry Hill, which is a fantastical Gothic castle um, uh, for the final episode of this series, The Raven. The Raven is more this Gothic horror type of style. And that's a very different world. That's a world populated by book fanatics and academics. One of the benefits of working during this pandemic is we've been able to film in locations that normally we would never be allowed to film in. We were in Strawberry Hill House in Twickenham, which is the most incredible house, museum. Uh, and normally that would be full of visitors. And the same with this hotel. It's usually a hotel and we are actually filming in it and staying here. And it's a joy. You just don't get those opportunities much at all. So the next block, we're looking for a um, gallery space, and we've got a we've got a sculpture garden. So we've been looking at a place called um, Jack's Windmill. It is a very structural building 
which is made up of two big block houses with a wind, an old windmill in the back. So it's quite unique. The gallery is a bit more abstract, a bit more futuristic. Um, I would call it 60s futuristic in a way. But yeah, seeing the mood boards and what we're going for, um, it's going to be all about, you know, interesting shapes and, and colours and a lot of lighting and, and creating an, an art gallery that is not necessarily your, you know, your given art gallery with a painting on the wall, you know. The secret is that Wild Marsh is actually formed of three different villages and towns. There's not one location for it, so it's uh, composed of Farningham, which is, they're all towns in Kent actually, aren't they? Mm -hmm. uh, Farningham, Cranbrook and Smarden. And we've kind of pieced together this fictional town of Wild Marsh from different elements of those places. Well, the world of Wild Marsh itself, um, for me, was inspired by a television series from, from the 60s called The Prisoner. Um, which was filmed in Port Marion in Wales, in which it's it's all white houses and it's perfect, but it's all a little bit surreal and strange. Um, it's another world from which you can't escape. So that's why we have a lot of white clapboard houses and windmills and oast houses and white picket fences. A typical day um, would be picked up very early sort of half past five in the morning um, by one of our lovely drivers. I get picked up at like five, you know, early. Uh, <laughs> and then um, <laughs> get driven. Sometimes it's like 20 minutes, sometimes like two hours, depends on what, what the location is. Into the makeup chair where Lisa, the uh, makeup designer, will stick these gel things under my eyes in an attempt to make me look alive and like a normal human and then we'll um we'll put the wig on it's a wig um which involves twisting all my hair into a stocking cap and then pinning me in a million times because i'm a policeman i got the full gear so i'm in like 10 layers of stuff and it's like i'm i'm like i'm like a slim dude but it makes me you know i look i look like i'm a i'm a big man I like a moan when I arrive in the makeup wagon. I like to complain about anything that comes into my head. I like to share the love. Go into costume and makeup for 15 hours, <laughs> in our case. <laughs> uh, you're waited on hand and foot. It's a brilliant crew. We have an amazing crew on this show. They should be applauded. Um, and then it's uh, into costume, into makeup. Um, yeah. Hey. Hey, not, not bad, eh? It takes a really, really long time to get me to look like a human. A really long, I mean, unbelievably long. Even I don't believe how long it's going to take. A uh, bit of a temperature test, COVID test, if it's COVID test day. Everyone now has to check into the COVID tent for their temperature checked and to fill out a health declaration to say they don't have any symptoms and twice a week for testing. You know, any close crew are wearing two masks and a visor. Um, there's a lot of hand washing. Um, but actually, because we're tested so much, we are able to, uh, to be in close proximity. Then a quick bit of breakfast, usually as they're knocking on the door asking if you're ready to travel to set. You see, when you start filming, you think, OK, I'm only going to be eating salads. I won't have biscuits, because there are biscuits all day, every day. I won't be doing that. I have to keep I have to keep on top of things, I have to be slim, to fit into the costumes. We are now seven weeks into it and I can't fit into any of the costumes. I haven't stopped eating the biscuits. There are chocolate bars that come out at tea time and biscuits. The breakfasts are beautiful. So the idea of just having just a tiny little bit of scrambled egg with a little tiny bit of spinach. I'm now having a hash brown, some toast, some beans, some egg, some sausage, some bacon some mushrooms, a tomato. I've said hash brown, but I'll say it again because there are two, I usually have two hash browns. So that's 10 things on my breakfast plate alone. Siobhan and Julie, the other two aunts, they're very good with their food. No, 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 no biscuits for me. Can I have their, bi could I have their biscuits? Could I have their biscuits? Uh, and then, and then taken up to whisked off to, to, to set. And um, hopefully, Know your lines. What does a day involve directing Queens of Mystery? Well, you know, it's a challenging day, of course, and it's a multitasking day. I've already planned 
my shots, you know, so I'm, I have right in there, I've got a week's worth in, in my folder, I have a week's worth of shot lists. I know every shot I'm going to be shooting for the next seven days. Once we kind of get to know what the scene is, is like, then the crew come on and we do a crew show. So everybody in the crew knows what's involved in that scene. Actors go back into makeup and then the set is lit and prepared. And then as the day progresses, we have to stay on schedule, you know, because so we have to work quickly. It's a very intense and high pressured environment and people move fast. We do move quite quickly on this show, which I enjoy. So you might go and sit down for a bit while they change the setup. Um, you know, if they're turning the cameras around, they'll need to clear the, the back of the shot. So generally, not too much waiting around. It's sort of, it, the rule is, as soon as your cup of tea is at drinking temperature, you have to go back on set. So you never wait long enough to make and drink a cup of tea. That's the rule. And I think the one thing that, for people who aren't used to being on set, that is always a surprise, is how little shooting we actually do. <laughs> you know, we film three minutes worth of content roughly a day. And then, yeah, we film till about seven o'clock at night. So it's, yeah, it's a long day. Filming here has been lovely because we, we hardly ever get to be in the same location for more than a couple of days. So we've been here for, we're gonna film here for a couple of weeks. So it's actually really nice to, to be somewhere that's, um, well, I mean, as you can see, it's absolutely gorgeous. So it's a big country house with all the ground and the swimming pool, all the cast are staying here in a kind of COVID bubble. I'm really looking forward to uh, a couple of things we're gonna film. Um, because it, it turns out that uh, Detective Inspector Thorne was originally in the traffic police, um, at which he loved. He, he loved being in the traffic police. So there's a particular scene that I'm really looking forward to, uh, to Derek Thorne really embracing his past. Uh, my favourite scenes are just when all the ants are together, you know. Um... I'll meet you back at the recording booth. Why, where are you going? To do some digging on Henry Wade. Because I think that's the heart of the show, is, what, is that family unit, is when the, the aunts and Matilda are together. I think that's kind of the, certainly, the, yeah, the heart and soul of the show. So I think, you know, we always kind of try to um, make those scenes, you know, a, a kind of much more personal and much more lively. So they're always my favourites, because otherwise it's just, it, it, be, it can become quite kind of plotty. And all we're doing is exposition a lot of the time, which is important for the show, but, Actually, what's really fun is um, is the family dynamic and, and seeing that in action. So those are always the great things to do. I look forward to those scenes. I think what I'm really, I'm looking forward to, I haven't done it yet, is is the driving. I, don't, I haven't been, been able to drive anything. We have a beautiful motorbike in this, in this episode and a sidecar. I've been in the sidecar. That was the most exciting thing so far. Uh, but in the next one, I get to drive a van. And I have to say... I am overexcited about doing that. Really, really excited about doing that. The most challenging thing is driving the Morris Minor. It's so difficult to drive and trying to drive a difficult car with 30 people watching you and you've got to hit a mark and you've got to sort of press the accelerator whilst turning the key and pulling the choke. I've never had to drive a car with a choke before and it's the producer's car. <laughs> It's so stressful. I didn't even get out of first gear because I forgot about changing gears because I was so stressed. So yeah, more of that to come. One of the first things that I had to do when we were shooting this series was dance just a little bit of a tango. I woke up this morning and for some inexplicable reason, all I want to do is tango. Um, in Inspector Thorne's fantasy sequence, <laughs> him and Jean managed to to communicate effectively, which they don't seem to be able to do in real life because he can't speak to her. So on the dance floor, he doesn't have to speak. So we danced a bit of a tango, which was um, fun to do. I am very, very bad at dancing, but I like doing it. And it was lovely to be Jane where she didn't have an interesting fact to contribute, but just had to live in her skin. We're always looking to create a sense of danger for some of the characters, because after all, not all of them come through. I think the murders are always, they're always fun days on set, although very 
draining for some of the poor <laughs> actors who you just watch having to die again and again and again. You like, want to go and rescue them. So in the scene today, Beth has been asked to cover, there's a, there's a local newspaper called the Wild Marsh Chronicle, and Beth has been asked to cover a story about the spa, a new spa that's opened up. Um, so she's kind of roped Kat into coming along and having a supposedly fun spa weekend because um, she's got to write a review about it. And of course, they're just things go horribly wrong and there's just a huge high body count at the end of it, like there always is in Queen, The Queen's of Mystery. The scene we were filming by the pool today, it was just setting up that kind of, um, you know, there's a, there's a character there who is of who becomes of interest to um, to them later on, and she's she's quite actually vital to the story. So it's just them kind of um, observing all these observing all these characters um, by the pool. We are filming in March, April, uh, and, and and May, and today we were by a swimming pool. Uh, English weather being what it is. You can't rely on sun at any time of year, but especially not really at this time of year, which is why I'm wearing a rather large coat, because I've just been in a, a yellow swimsuit. They're very good with keeping us as warm as they can. But for Beth, she doesn't seem to like coats, which is really unfortunate, because as a human being, I get very cold. Um, and there are a lot of other uh, people out there right now, actually, freezing around a pool. Today I am handsome silver-haired man swimming in pool. That was my description in the script, it wasn't. Uh, and then I think later on, I'm in another episode, I'm handsome silver-haired man being led away in handcuffs. You can see a reoccurring theme there. Um, but uh, they don't have to pay me that way, it's cheaper, it's cheaper, it's cheaper for production. Unfortunately, we've booked a very cold day for swimming in the pool, so uh, so I've only got myself to blame for that, really. He's good. He's really captured you, Matty. I think it looks more like Mum. Yeah, I mean, we were never sure just, you know, whether the approach that we were taking, taking would really connect with an audience. Mm. And it's just been completely thrilling that it has, that people have gone on the journey with us. You know, when you get a team and they continue to work together and you begin to shorthand your strengths and, you know, the communication flows between that team, that you're able to be more ambitious and more confident. And we are this time around. I, I'm really watching images come in and performances and um, moments which are really uh, kind of make the hair stand up on the back of your neck because you know you've got some kind of magic going on. So, um, and I think costume, art department, um, every aspect of the film has gone that much further this time around. And one thing that's been so great coming back into production is that the queens, all of our aunts and Matilda, I think they've also had the chance to build that chemistry over a season. So they've really, you know, hit the ground running yeah. in this episode, these um, episodes, and they're they're bouncing off each other and funnier than ever, and that's been really fun to watch. And we also talk as well about how we do our, love our boys. So you know, Thorn and PC Foster. Today, Foster, sir and Dr. Daniel Lynch. Dr. Lynch? Yeah, they, we have a great affection for them, both the cast members and their <laughs> characters. And so, uh, yeah, it's been, it feels, it really does feel like a family, a family business. <laughs> you know, you write these lines, which you think are sort of, in your little office, you think, oh, that's quite funny. And then you see someone like Martin or Siobhan say that line, and it's 10 times better than you could ever imagined it. You don't know how they do it, you know, it's brilliant. Thank you very much. Fab. Very good. Wonderful. Very good.